I'm blessed to, I'm Doug Harris, I'm a Deputy Tribal Historic Preservation Officer with the Narragansett Indian Tribe. I'm also a preservationist for ceremonial landscapes. Can you hear me? Uh, I think the microphone is for the camera, but not for the audio system. So I shall project. <laughs> And if my projection kind of is a low, just wave at me and I'll, I'll pick it up. I'm a preservationist for ceremonial landscapes. And um, there came a time in my life when I called on my ancestors and I asked them to help me find meaningful things to do with my life. And lo and behold, they stepped up, and I'm dealing with this weird thing called ceremonial stone landscapes. And I've had a lot of people say, well, what's that all about? And I have to admit, I don't really know. I'm on a mission, like many of you, the stones have spoken to me, and they've asked if I will help protect them from all of us humans. And so that's what I do. And I think I see a few of you who've also been spoken to by the stones. <laughs> and you don't know why, but you know that you do, and you know that they're important. Um, we're going to go through the standard presentation, and um, Mr. Haskins is going to show some sites from your region. We'll discuss them a bit, and we'll have questions and answers, and uh, we'll see where all of this goes. Um, let the landscape speak for itself. The man who gave me that saying passed away about a month ago. Um, Lloyd Running Wolf Wilcox, he was the elder medicine man of the Narragansett tribe. And I had the occasion of working at the Turner Falls Airport in Montague, Massachusetts. And I began to see stones that I responded to as being ceremonial. And I began to show them to the archaeologists I was working with because they were looking at a Paleolithic site. Hey, Kathy, how are you doing? <laughs> This is Kathy Taylor from Upton, who is one of the coordinators of the Narragansett Indian Tribal Historic Preservation Trust. The trust was created to protect a ceremonial stone landscape in Upton once it was impacted by its landowner. Um, and we were able to um, buy from him that property the Pratt Hill property, um, and we put it under the protection of a 501c3 trust. And Kathy and Becky Wetzel are um, the coordinators for that process, and uh, they, they keep us sane and safe. <laughs> um, how did the walk go? Very, very good. All right. If you haven't gone on the walk that Kathy and Becky put together in Upton, you should get in touch with them. And it starts at the, what's referred to as the Upton Cave or the Upton Chamber, uh, and it goes up the hill to um, Pratt Hill, where there are many structures. So let the landscape speak for itself. I began talking to the archaeologists, and I said, We've got some ceremonial stones up here on the other side of the hill. They were digging for and finding and protecting Paleolithic stones that had been recognized that were in that place. Uh, the Federal Aviation Administration was funding an improvement of the airport runway. And so this, as a federal undertaking, had to have tribal consultation and there had to be examination by archaeologists to see what needed to be protected there. When I started adding this other dimension, that up on that hill I'd found some ceremonial stones, 
The archaeologists, as they have always did, kind of patted me on the head to let me know that uh, I was in fantasy land and um, that those stones were really the result of farm clearing and um, uh, don't you understand, Doug? <laughs> and I didn't and uh, I insisted and my insistence forced the Federal Aviation Administration to say, we don't know what to do with this issue. We're gonna take it to Washington, D.C., and we'll let the National Register sort it out because the archeologists were under a permit from the Mass Historic Commission, and that per the Mass Historic Commission does not acknowledge ceremonial stones as existing. They're always the result of farm clearing. So, um, in my naive state, I assume that if you've got a federal agency called the FAA and they're going to take something to Washington, D.C., and they're going to leave it to an agency in Washington, D.C. to figure out that the FAA and the National Register would get behind closed doors and make a determination that would not be in our favor. That was my assumption. Uh, later on, the... Um, the man who was responsible for um, this process said to me, all I can guarantee you is a level playing field and we'll see what happens. Well, the level playing field ended up with us winning the argument and um, they made a determination in favor of the tribes and very much to the chagrin of the State Historic Preservation Office, not in their favor. They printed their opinion, but decided with us. So, but what happened in the interim? I went to the medicine man and I said, uh, Mr. Wilcox, I don't think we're gonna win this one. The only thing I know to do is I'll lay down if I have to in front of a bulldozer. And, and to protect these ceremonial stones. He says, well, you may have to do that, but before you go that far, let me tell you this. Do not rely on tribal oral history or tribal lore because they know how to undercut that. Let the landscape speak for itself and let the lore and the oral history stand as its witness. And that was the wisdom that he offered me that day. And I straightened up and popped out of his office feeling like I knew the truth. It only took me three days to figure out that I did not know what the heck he was talking about. Um, but it was about two weeks later that a young lady called me. Um, she was from the town of Leverett, Massachusetts. And she said, I have a map um, that I've constructed because ever since I was about eight years old, I was carried into the woods and shown these sites. And as an adult, I've been going back and documenting them and putting them on a map, a computer map. And that was a young lady by the name of Eva Gibovic. And we've been using Eva's system as we expand it. We've been using it ever since. Um, and that is the process by which we let the landscape speak for itself. And we've been shocked at how much people are willing to listen to the landscape because we show them all these dots. This is where these features are. And this is our interpretation of what the ancients were doing with them. And I will admit that sometimes we're right and sometimes we're not, but we do the best we can and we're learning a heck of a lot and we are protecting a lot of places. Next slide. This is the first United South and Eastern Tribes resolution dealing with ceremonial stone landscapes and it um, is referred to as USET Resolution 2003-22. It was crafted in 2002 at the 
uh, Mohegan Reservation where we were meeting uh, with the United South and Eastern Tribes. And at that point, the United South and Eastern Tribes was comprised of 24 federally recognized tribes from Maine to Texas. There are about 31 now. We've had a number of, of new entries as members. Uh, four of them are from tribes in Virginia who now have their federal recognition. There are two points, well, three points that I'll make in this. Um, let me know if you can't hear me. <laughs> Just raise your hand. But 24 federally recognized tribes. This focused on Acton, Carlisle, Concord, Lincoln, Littleton, Stowe, Boxborough, and Westford. Why those towns? Because we had, um, I was only aware of these ceremonial stones on the Narragansett Reservation. And we started out with a guy by the name of Jick Davis. Anybody here know Jick? I was in a meeting a few nights ago and one man said, I know Jick, he, he's on the other side of the hill from me. Well, <coughs> Mr. Benfield, who owned the property, who was in his 90s, asked Jick, who was his landscaper, call some Indians and find out if they think these things are important because I want to get, I want to do some logging in a state grant, but I don't want to affect anything that may be Indian. So this guy, Jick Davis, calls our office. And we talk to him. And we decide, this guy's a nut. We don't respond. The next year, he calls. And it's the nut again on the phone. <laughs> and we don't respond. The third year, Jick Davis calls. And I'm told by the head of my office, look, go up and see what this nut really wants. <laughs> I got up there, and I was totally blown away by what Jick Davis showed me. The ceremonial stones were, in fact, ceremonial. And there was the highest concentration I had ever seen and the highest variety that I had ever seen. So sometimes you got to just follow where a nut leads you um, because he may know what he's talking about. Um, Jick and Vicky um, introduced me to, their, to Jick's dad, his dad and his mom. So I was on my way to a United South and Eastern Tribes meeting, and they had protected those stone features. I get a call from him and he says, right next to where you saw those other stones, well now they want to put in a McMansion, and I don't know what to do. I don't, I, how do I stop them? Because the stones are in that area too. I said, well, the best I can do is I will try to get you a resolution that you may be able to use as a tool to leverage some control. Please have a seat and thank you for joining us. There's seats up front. So, this is what we generated out of my commitment to Jick Davis, <clears throat> and I sent it back to him and I said, because um, his, his dad is a very insightful man, James Davis, and he said, the only thing I would add to it is add more than Carlisle. Some of our neighboring towns had these as well, so we added the additional towns. And of course, by now we figured out that these are not only in Massachusetts and New England and the rest of the United States. They go as far west as California, Yurok territory. <clears throat> and I met a Yurok medicine man at the first meeting of the Tribal Historic Preservation Offices in Washington, D.C. And he said to me, we are your people. Oh, 
He says, yes, we come from the East Coast. 2,000 years ago, we walked out along the glacier all the way to California, and we brought our traditions and our language with us. So we speak an Algonquin language, and the ceremonial stones are a part of our tradition. <laughs> Blew me away. I thought they were just, first I thought they were just on our reservation. Then they were up where Crazy Jick lived. And then now they're all over the country. It is a cultural tradition that I have found in Alabama. Um, I've been, had it reported in Colorado, uh, all across the country. <laughs> now, if at any point in this presentation you have questions, just Holler out. So, two points. <clears throat> this is the core of our belief system. For thousands of years before the immigration of Europeans, the Pawas or medicine people of today's New England region used this sacred landscape to sustain the people's reliance on Mother Earth. Our reliance on Mother Earth was the core of our belief system. And that's our reliance on Mother Earth in her relationship to our Creator. And that we are a part of the spirit energies of balance and harmony. And when that balance and harmony falls short, we call on her. And what I was told was that a way of calling on her was to speak a prayer into a stone and place it on the ground and that prayer would be responded to by her. Under what circumstances might this happen? If a man gets killed, a person gets killed by an animal or another human being, when their body is found, they're taken away to the village, they're buried or they're cremated. But what the people found was that at the place where the trauma occurred, sometimes things were still out of balance very much out of balance. And so someone at some point asked a medicine person to go there and rebalance it. And what the medicine person did was to speak a prayer into a stone and place it on the place of great trauma. And apparently that became the procedure. Other people would come along and say a prayer into a stone and place it where the medicine person and I say medicine person because we had medicine men and medicine women, and I don't know who was the smart one there. <laughs> so it was a medicine person. So the stone groupings that many people refer to as carns were produced in that manner as prayer groupings to our mother, the earth. Now, if you use the term Karn and you are in Scotland or Ireland, you are spot on. You're not in Scotland or Ireland anymore. So you're in Algonquin territory, as the anthropologists have termed it, based upon their relationship to the Jesuits who began to recognize that the language and customs of the Algonquin were all over this region. And it was a part of the coherent culture. We refer to them as Manatu, spirit, Hasun Nash. Hasun is the word for stone, Hasun Nash is the word for many stones. So a Manatu Hasanash is, in Algonquin language, a karn if you're in Scotland or Ireland. So the heart of the belief system is a relationship to our mother, the earth. The other piece that is important from this is that the United South and Eastern Tribes, the USAT Tribes, wish to partner with the towns which have stewardship of these properties in order to create historical preservation plans that will support the permanent protection of these sacred landscapes. We have just in the last two years begun to honor that commitment. And we honor that commitment by offering to towns memorandums of understanding. And what the MOU does is that it 
recognizes that in your town jurisdiction, tribes have no say. But within your town jurisdiction, you have no federal tribal say. So if we develop a memorandum of understanding with your town, that allows you to call us in to back up your choice to protect something that is tribal. Anybody have any questions about that? That's what an MOU does. It gives force and effect to federal guidance that we come with within your town boundaries where we have no jurisdiction. But in that way, you can begin to protect the ceremonial stones, a burial place, uh, a village site, because we will consult with you and give you our knowledge. The National Historic Preservation Act acknowledges that only tribes had the expertise, the special expertise, to determine for the purposes of the National Register what is of religious and cultural significance to tribes. That's law. And we've gotten around finally to exercising our rights under that law. Next slide, please. This is a Manatu Hasanash, or what some might call Kar. Next, and those presumably are stones that were placed there in prayer. I wasn't there, I don't know. <laughs> Next slide. This is on the Narragansett Reservation, and it's a boulder that has stones on it. Hasun, stones. Next slide. This doesn't exist like this anymore. This was in Upton. The landholder got really upset because Indians had any say on his property and he went out there one Sunday with a backhoe and played golf with those stones. So they don't exist like that anymore. The silver lining to that cloud is that after um, a period of time, uh, he came to a planning board meeting with his son and his daughter in hand, and he said, I don't know anything about this Indian stuff, but I understand that what was done up there on my property was not the ex acceptable thing to do. And I would just like to say to the public that I will sell this property only for purposes of preservation. Well, a few years later, we happened, our office happened to have some mitigation funds, and we went to the gentleman and we said, um, are you still interested in selling this property? He says, yes. I said, how much are you asking for? He said, well, for the 32 acres that you're looking at, I'm talking $600,000. But for you, I'll sell it for half that. Well, we created a 501c3 called the Narragansett Indian Tribal Historic Preservation Trust. And the trust is now the proud protector of that ceremonial 32 acres. Not only that, but in town, there were several elderly ladies who had property, 70 acres, that also had ceremonial stones. And they came to us and said, uh, uh, would you like to buy our property because the taxes, wetland taxes, are getting to be too high? I said, we don't have any more money. So that's unfortunate. A year later, they contacted us and said, would you accept a donation? And they donated those 70 acres into the protection of the Narragansett Indian Tribal Historic Preservation Trust, for which the protectors and coordinator are Kathy Taylor, and Becky Wetzel. Thank you again for the work that you all do. Uh, Kathy just came in from a walk. They do tours from the chamber in the valley, a mile away in the valley, up to Pratt Hill. So please uh, make contact with her and, and take the guided tour. It shows you what can happen in your community as well. Next slide. This is adjacent to the uh, 501 C3 protected property. There's a wall that separates this 
and this is on DCR property. Um, it's the Upton State Forest, and there's a circle of stones. And the circle of stones has this stone. It's not quite in the middle, but you can see there's a shadow here. Well, what we found, or what Kathy found, is that shadow is not only there during the sunlight, but it's there during the moonlight. So we're not quite sure which one it's supposed to be dealing with or whether it's both. Um, but it casts a shadow and apparently the shadows uh, are, they register between the stones, not on the stones. So we're learning through observation what the significance of this might be. Next slide. What is this? A turtle. It's a turtle effigy, and this is down in Killingworth, Connecticut. Uh, and you'll find turtles in the woods in many different forms, but this is probably the most pristine turtle I have encountered. The head, the carapace, front paws, rear paws, and it even has a tail that you can't see. Next slide. This is another effigy figure. This is a serpentine row. And um, there are about four elements that tell you that you're looking at a serpentine row. There's a head. There's a body that usually undulates even more than this. Um, there is a tail that is usually in a body of water, a spring, a stream, or a pond. And, um, in New England, the head is profiled like this. What we found in Western New York and down in Pennsylvania is that the serpentine rows are what they call vipers. And the head is flat and wedge-shaped. Um, there are a couple of other things that, please come on in and have a seat. Thank you for joining us. Great to see you. And I did get your email. <laughs> um, next slide. Can you see this? This is the scorpion in Scorpius. What the ancient tribal people saw was this. It is a serpent with horns. Um, in the the tradition of this region, we can only speak its name at certain times of the year. Um, it will bring you bad dreams otherwise. Uh, but I can speak of it in another uh, tradition, and that is the Cherokee tradition. This is referred to as Uktena, U-K-T-E-N-A. And it has, it's a serpent with horns. Can you see that? Okay. And you see that right here in its neck or forehead, depending on how you look at the anatomy, um, is the star Antares. And the lore among the Cherokee is that if you find the serpent, the Uktena, in the land, you will find it with that jewel. And if you can snatch that jewel, you'll be rewarded with all manner of powers. We don't know anybody who has come away being able to snatch that jewel. We don't know if they got gobbled up by the Uktena or if they just weren't successful. <clears throat> However, let's see, now I'm, depending on which set of slides I'm showing you, let's take a look at the next slide. Ah, it is good. The other thing that you will often find, but not always, is this niche behind the serpent's head and it has a orange stone, quite often jasper, in that niche. And that is replicating the star on Taurus. Now I say sometimes you will find that because I've found many that didn't have it. But I've also found many that did. So as below, or so ab as above, so below, that the serpentine row that is in the sky 
has the star Antares, and so do those on the ground. Next slide. This is at Turner Falls, and this is a Manitou stone. Um, and this is a Manitou stone, and it has head, shoulders, waist, loins, and this much of it was showing. You can see the lichen growth, but all of that was buried. And I had passed that tens of times. I had never seen it. <coughs> we were doing an interview with um, the videographer for the uh, Arctic Studies program at the uh, Smithsonian Institution. He had agreed to document what we were doing. And uh, I was to have an interview with the select board, the chair of the select board that day. And I had been informed through spirit communication that I needed someone else there. And that someone else was a gentleman by the name of Norm Muller. Norm um, is a, he's a, well, he's retired now. He was a, an art conservator at Princeton University. But in his spare time, he traveled all over the Northeast looking at ceremonial stone features and mainly in Pennsylvania. And for whatever reason, I needed Norm there. I called Norm and I asked, can you come up? He said, I'm sorry, um, can't travel anymore. How, what, what, what happened? He said, well, my wife tells me that I'm over budget. <laughs> I said, well, if we cover your costs, can you come up? He said, I'll have to, I'll have to talk to the lady. <laughs> So his wife gave him an approval to come up if we paid his costs. So we rented him a vehicle and took care of his expenses. Uh, and as I'm being interviewed, um, talking to the chairwoman of the select board, I hear from the other side of the field, Norm bellowing out, Doug, Doug, come over here. I went over, and this is what he had found. Something that I had walked by time and time again, but had never seen. And he was supposed to be there because he found it. So it all, it's not always an Indian's eye that it takes. It takes whoever is spiritually attuned. Next slide. This is another form of Manitou stone. This is also at the Turner Falls Airport. And as you can see, it has, it's niched out here or notched out there. And it's pointing in that direction and that direction is the direction in the southwest to what the Narragansett call Kautantowit's house. Kautantowit is one of the spirit energies that the Narragansett tradition relies on. And there are many things that point toward Kautantowit's house. And it was from Kautantowit's house and Kautantowit's fields that Crow, brought the agrarian tradition to the people of the Northeast. And that was in the form of the seeds of corn, bean, and squash. Corn in its beak, bean and squash in each of its ears. Any questions so far? All right, next slide. This we argued about. The archaeologists were insisting, this is a stone wall, Doug. And Doug insisted, no, it is not. It is a ceremonial stone row. Why is that? This stone, and this stone, and that stone, next slide, create a triangle. And if you stand on the base of that triangle, you're looking at, next slide, Mount Pocumtuck, 15 and a half miles away, where the sun sets in that notch every August 11th, 12th, and 13th. And why is that significant? Well, 
Next slide. <clears throat> Beyond that notch are these standing stones. Next slide. And that is the time of year of the highest concentration of the Perseid media shower. Now, why is the Perseid media shower important? As you know, the shower occurs for a month, <clears throat> a full month, but this is the highest concentration. And it is believed <clears throat> that the meteor shower represents the spirits of those who are deceased during the year. And they are making their journey <clears throat> to Katandrawit's house. That is the sweet spot in the West. We all, if we don't get stuck here on earth, we all go to the West upon our demise. But you want to go to Katantowicz house. Next slide. This is on the Narragansett Reservation. <clears throat> and this we call an observer's seat. And it's a place where you sit and you observe <clears throat> celestial events at different times of the year and those celestial events are usually lined up with stone features this is one of the few people who sits in that seat he happens to be the son of the medicine man i've never sat in that seat i'm not a part of the medicine family but um, <clears throat> we're blessed to now have this young man working with us <clears throat> next slide this is the seat, um, not in silhouette. This appears to be an effigy figure. We're not quite sure whether it is a dancer or whether it's an addle addle thrower, um, but it's something. And we, I wasn't there, so I don't know what the, the ancients intended. Next slide. This is what you can see from that seat. All of these are stone alignments. This would be the seat. And when, two years after we did the mapping, we were informed that the tribe had gotten a grant to build a medical center. And that medical center, funded by um, the Department of, let's see, Agriculture, I believe, the footprint was going to cover these alignments. I wrote a letter to the chief of the tribe, Matthew Thomas, and I said, uh, honorable chief, <laughs> we got a problem. And that problem is that if you put that medical center where it's designed to be put, it's going to keep the future youth of the tribe from learning geometry, and astronomy based upon an instrument that their ancestors left in the landscape. It took about three days for him to respond and he said, even if we have to lose this grant, we're not going to um, keep the youth of the future from being able to have that connection to their ancestors. But if you can find a way to get around this problem, we sure would appreciate it. Um, I went back to our um, physicist who um, serves as an astronomer, and um, his recommendation was, well, just rotate the design 70 feet on its axis, and it'll free up those alignments. I made that recommendation. They redesigned the building to be 70 feet twisted on its axis. And next slide. The building is there today. We're quite pleased. And uh, the, this is another member of the medicine family. The seat uh, is not obstructed and it, the view from that is not obstructed. And we often find observer seats where either they are dedicated to 
one celestial event. It may be a winter solstice sunrise or sunset, or it may be multiple positions from any one seated position. Next slide. This is one of the things it's observing. Most split boulders are split vertically. In this case, it's a horizontal angled split and you see stones in it and presumably those stones are prayer stones that are designed to either keep something in or keep something out. And again, I wasn't there, I don't know. But that's the, the belief system. Next slide. This is also on the Narragansett Reservation. It's a signal rock. And you find them all up and down the East Coast. And we are told that they were used to signal from one place to another. And I don't know the signaling technology, um, but presumably you could, they were balanced so that you, one person could rock it and it would thump on the bedrock. And it would send a sound through the bedrock to the next signaling station and it would be carried on right on down the coast. So it might be a signal that said, prepare, the Mohawks are coming. Or it might have been a signal, we've got a messenger coming through, give him safe passage. Um, Next slide. This is the mouth of the Upton Chamber. If you go there today, this is how it looks. Uh, and it had a problem where uh, one of its owners had tried to remove um, one of the stones to close it, I'm told, so that you wouldn't have to worry about people going in and being a liability. Um, and. Um, the town chose to purchase the property and they named it Heritage Park and they then had an archaeologist um, who was a stonemason. His mother was Pinnacoke Indian, his father was Scottish, his father sent him back to Scotland to learn the stonemason's craft and he came back and he's no longer with us but he came back and began to become a repairer of stone structures. And he repaired this one. And what was found on top of it, and I'm sorry I don't have a picture, but up here on top of that lentil, there was a petroglyph of a bird's head. And it looked like an eagle, no, sorry, it looked like a crow or a raven, and we're not quite sure which, but it, it emphatically stated for us that it was a place of ceremony. Next slide. Now this graphic shows in profile what the chamber is. And a very interesting thing that we discovered was that with this chamber, not like most, but with this chamber, you had to slosh through water. And so the people who in the town uh, asked the stonemason, uh, while you're fixing that entrance, you think you could uh, solve that plumbing problem? And we stepped forward and said, well, wait a minute. Before you solve that plumbing problem, let us get an opinion. And we went back to our um, physicist, who's our astronomer, and asked him for an opinion. And what he wrote up was that that water serves as a reflective surface. And standing in the back of the chamber, if you look also into the reflection of what's up on the hill, what you will see is 17% more image of what's happening astronomically in the celestial realm behind Pratt Hill. So I asked him, I said, look, go ahead, answer your phone. <laughs> it may be important. You may have hit the lottery. <laughs> or she may be telling you, <laughs> where are you? <laughs> Not a problem. Yes, ma'am. How do you 
get in there? Pardon me? How do you get in there? Oh, there's, go back one slide. Through that opening. I know, but on the diagram, where is that? That's in the, that's over here. And so when you decide to come, uh, please wear your, your boots uh, and you can go in and Kathy will take you into the chamber. Uh, and I'll tell uh, I went in there once with a group of tribal people and uh, it was the United South and Eastern Tribes had a, uh, it was either at Pequot or at Mohegan, had uh, one of its conferences. And so we had a bus trip up to uh, this area and to visit the chamber. And there was an Indian there from out west. And um, I don't recall which tribe. We all went in and we all came out. And so I asked him, I said, so what did you think? He said, the spiders, the spiders. <laughs> I had never noticed a spider in there, but all he saw inside were spiders in the crevices. But uh, so, if you have if, if you have arachnophobia, uh, just get prepared. But when you come, ma'am, please wear your 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 galoshes. Okay. And you should come. You should visit the the Upton Chamber, and that young lady right there will take you on that tour. I, I have a few brochures. <clears throat> okay. Kathy says she has some brochures. Next slide. This is another form of chamber. This is in North Smithfield, Rhode Island. And uh, this man bought the property. He loved the chamber. He said he actually wanted to put his house right there, but he decided to put the house on the other side of the property so the chamber is protected in his, the left side of his front yard. This is at a place called Black Plain Hill. And Black Plain Hill was a Nike base. The uh, United States government, in its infinite wisdom, during the Cold War, put a Nike base on the top of Black Plain Hill. And then it got decommissioned. And uh, now it is the Air National Guard facility for Rhode Island. Next slide. And this is one of the features that we found on Black Plain Hill. Now, these are two bears. One is a standing on its hind legs and the other one standing on all fours. And the one that's standing on its hind legs is probably about a foot high. This is a close-up photograph, so it looks a lot bigger. Um, and our uh, physicist says that he believes that this sun line is a part of the ancient ceremonies. And we haven't quite figured out exactly what and exactly when it is best seen. Next slide. But this is behind it. And this is a bare head effigy. And this we believe to be an observer seat. And you observe the two bears and what you are observing at the time of the fall equinox is the next slide. The two bears, we call this an artificial horizon line, and this is the Big Dipper. Now, in Narragansett tradition, I went to a work known as, in, in the Keys of the Language of America by Roger Williams. Any of you know that book? This gentleman knows it. I recommend it to all of you because in the uh, early 1600, Roger Williams spent time with the Narragansett and wrote down much of what they told him about lore and culture and language. And in that, he tells us that the Narragansett referred to the Big Dipper as two things. Mosque, which is the word for bear, and the other was 
パーコナワパーコナワ And I did not know that word. And so I, as I often do, I ask Creator and the ancestors to wake me up and tell me what something is that I don't understand. And one morning they woke me up and had me reach over and look at the word kunam. And the word kunam means a dipper or a ladle. And if you put pa wa in the front and the back of kunam, you have a compound word that is pa kunawa, and it's pa wa is medicine person, and kunam is the ladle or spoon of a medicine person. So, okay, now what does that mean? And I still don't know. <laughs> But I've got some guesses. The guesses may or may not be valid. But I know the bear tradition among the Iroquois, and in the bear tradition of the Iroquois, this tells the story of three hunters who are chasing the bear, and in the autumn, they wound the bear, and you get the red in the trees, and that would be the blood of the bear. And then after that, it comes winter, and you get the snows, and that's the rendering of the fat of the bear. And that's how the Iroquois tell the story. That's not Narragansett tradition. So I went back and I started asking, what could this be? And I, we found the same alignment with artificial horizon lines in many different places. So, This is the question that I leave all of us with on this. At the time of the equinox, that's the only time of year when the、um, dipper is visible, and for three consecutive days, it rises one star after another over this horizon line. So, my question would be. Is that in some way a formula, a prescription formula for a medicine person in dealing with one of his or her patients? So we know that the bear was observed by the medicine people as being a being that consumes plants and has the same response that humans would have. So, if you see a bear eat it, you can eat it. And if you see a bear avoid it, you'd better avoid it.、Um, but berries, excellent. But other herbs are also tonics and medicines for the bear, and tonics and medicines for the human. So, the medicine person may have asked the question of the bear spirit about what medicine is needed. In prescription for this particular patient. And the rest is still an open question. I leave that with you and with us. Next slide. What is this? A whale. This is down in、um, Connecticut, and、uh, it was Kathy and I were partnered up walking、uh, a gas line project. We came over a hill. And we should have known something auspicious was going to happen because a group of blackbirds, and、I'd, I wasn't looking closely enough, it may have been ravens or it may have been crows, went over our heads and landed in the trees, the forest ahead of us. We were coming down the hill and we were、um, inclined to walk through some stones, and our gas line guide was telling us, not there, not there, he was keeping us within the right of way. And he was heckling us. Next thing we know, he's doing some weird dance. And the weird dance he was doing was fighting off yellow jackets. <laughs> so we, got, we took a look in his direction, and it was this whale that we saw. Now, I can't tell you any more than I've told you about the whale. It's clear that this is a mouth. And that's an eye, and it's a whale breaching.、Um, 
What's it doing inland? We don't know. Was it a part of the ceremonies of the people of the area? We don't know. Earth Mother put it there, and we have to deal with it. Next slide. Well, you've met this guy before. Um, this is down in Pennsylvania, and this is what you see a great deal of. Stones that are stacked in that fashion. And we were told, I was contacted by uh, the people who own 3,000 pristine acres that was about to be interrupted by gas line project. And they said that the Delaware tribe of Oklahoma had sent an archeologist who was a woman at the University of Pennsylvania to represent them. And she came out and she saw these and said, oh, these are stones that migrated down the mountain and collected. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, horse pucky, right? <laughs> um, they sent me a picture and I said, well, if we had these in our area, they would be considered ceremonial. So I went down with the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Wampanoag Tribe of Gay Aquina and the Deputy Tribal <coughs> Historic Preservation Officer for the Mohegan Tribe and Kathy, and we stopped there on our way to the United South and Eastern Tribes meeting in February of that year. And we were put up by the family. They served us a wonderful seven course catered meal. Um, and uh, the next day we spent walking on their property and I, as a result, wrote a letter to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission making it clear that the archeologist who had suggested that these, this was natural and they had migrated down the hill uh, was false and incorrect. That this was put there by tribal people and it was a part of tribal tradition and they needed to make sure that they were not impacted. Yes, sir. Um, the town is Dallas, and uh, that's in the Wyoming and Lucerne counties. Yes, sir. Do you have any inkling of what the purpose of that structure is? Well, inkling, no. Uh, my belief is that it's a part of the ceremonial tradition and would again have been a part of the tradition of calling for balance and harmony. Uh, beyond that, I don't have a clue. Yes, ma'am. If the Scots and Irish who moved here also built similar structures, how can you tell the difference between the ones that they might have built and the ones that natives here did? Well, <clears throat> we have submitted to the National Register a document that is referred to as a multiple property listing, and that addresses indigenous American ceremonial stone landscapes of the Northeast. And it states that because if an Irishman or a Scotsman comes here and builds a stone grouping in 50 years, it's eligible for the National Register. And we'd like to leave that open so if they do come here, or if they have been here, that's possible. Um, these we know to be tribal, um, and I'm not sure how I would make a distinction if a hundred years ago an Irishman or a Scotsman built a stone grouping. But these, we are told, are tribal. Any further questions on that? Just that somebody recognizes the style or something. Well, in Scotland and Ireland, as well as in other parts of the world, stones are used in ceremony. So we can't claim that we're the only people who ever did that, um, but we do claim to be able to recognize what is indigenous. And if we're proven wrong, then you'll know it. Is the thing called like America's Stonehenge that we have a little block of here, is, was that a name? I'm told that it was. I have never been there, okay. and, and um, I understand that it has been altered by many people trying to make it many different things. So 
Um, some people say, oh, no, 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 you can, you can still see the, the native influence there. And we'll, we'll know or we won't know. Any further questions? Yes? Yes. Oh yes, I think that they were. <laughs> um, you can assume that nature would have done that, or the glacier could have done it, but they are placed, and they're placed so that they are at intervals where the sound can be heard through the bedrock from site to site. Um, the one that I showed you earlier uh, doesn't operate anymore because some enterprising young Narragansett men, in expressing their prowess, moved it and it doesn't seat properly anymore. That was about 30 years ago. So we, we acknowledge it, but it doesn't rock anymore. Next slide. This is the last slide. These are the four tribes at this point that we are partnered with. The Aquina, Wampanoag Aquina, the Mashantucket Pequot, the Mohegan tribe, and the Narragansett. But this is essentially crucial because one of the things that we tried to get written into the multiple property listing, we have been told it would be illegal for us to put that in. And that would be because this multiple property listing cover, which is known as the Indigenous American Ceremonial Stone Landscapes, sites and districts nominated under this cover shall be identified or confirmed analyzed and certified by tribal historic preservation officers or officers or tribal authorities. We wanted that language in the multiple property listing. They said it would be illegal for us to have that language in there because it's not a part of the law that was enacted to create the National Register. I said, well, hey, wait a minute. The National Historic Preservation Act states, agency officials shall acknowledge that Indian tribes possess special expertise in assessing the eligibility of historic properties that may possess religious and cultural significance to them. And that's as per 36 CFR Part 800.4 C1. Isn't that law? Can't you? Nope, it wasn't the law that created us, so we can't use it compromise that we've made, <clears throat> so they suggested offer that to the states and have the states include that and have the states have you certify what they then pass on up to the National Register. So we're in the process of engaging in that. And the first example will probably be the state of Rhode Island, where we have been blessed with the keeper of the National Register retiring and being given the position of State Historic Preservation Officer for Rhode Island. So he has committed that he is willing to work with the tribes and our mapping specialist to make Rhode Island the first state that deals with ceremonial stone landscapes as a multiple property listing item. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> yes, Kathy. So how would the town go about setting up the memorandum of understanding? Well, thank you. <laughs> Perfect question. Um, <clears throat> we can share with you examples of how other towns have dealt with it. But basically, you would have preferably your um, historic commission because they have the greatest latitude. It's presumed that historic commissions can only deal with colonial houses. That's not true. They have the latitude to deal with anything of antiquity within their jurisdiction. So that can include Indian sites. And what we do, as I was explaining at the very beginning, is that we offer your town, since we have no jurisdiction within your town, we offer an institution within your town, whether it's the Historic Commission or the Select Board or the Conservation Commission, we offer consultation 
So we will back you on anything that you wish to protect that is of Indian significance. <clears throat> and that's done through a memorandum of understanding. If in fact we want to have a specific project that we'll work on, then we, set, we have, that's written into the MOU, we would have a separate agreement, a memorandum of agreement around that particular project that specifies what it is, whatever costs, whatever time frames. But the how is you just have to be willing and we'll give you um, a copy. Salt and pepper it to your taste. We salt and pepper it to our taste. <laughs> we then come to an agreement and that's it. Any further questions on that, Kathy? No, just a quick comment that often the Conservation Commission <coughs> knows more about these features than the Historical Commission, because a lot of times the Historical Commission knows a lot about old houses. <coughs> so we found that Upton, working closely with the Conservation Commission, we have a Stewardship Commission, and um, working closely um, is a good way to be able to identify and protect. Yes, sir. Um, are there any uh, funding possibilities for land protection uh, skills where uh, having ceremonial features uh, enhances your chances? Well, the answer is yes, and I don't know. <laughs> um, in Rhode Island, we have the Department of Environmental Management who right now is about to, or is funding protection of some ceremonial features. And the, the town of North Smithfield is uh, applying to them for those funds. Kathy? So, <clears throat> CPA money, Conservation Preservation Act, we bought Heritage Park with that funding. So, it's, it's, you know, it's for um, conservation, it's for uh, historical purposes, open space, and low income housing. So, the CPA money is a wonderful source of, of funding. It's, Oh, that's I would the historical commissions can buy property. The, the historical commission initiated buying the seven acre property for Heritage Park. So the historical commissions have um, a lot more power than some people know. So it's, it's good. It's, it's a document called something 40B, and it lists everything the historical commission can do. And in that document, you can purchase property. I would not turn down any donations. <laughs> you can also crowdsource. There are many possibilities. And one of the things that we have begun to look at is preservation tourism. And not everybody's in agreement with us. So it's still in the formation stages. But the belief is that if your town is protecting a series of ceremonial stone features, then the tribes can assist you in focusing people to come and see what you're protecting. And those people can come and spend money in your bread and bed and breakfast, they can come and spend money at your gas station, they can come and spend money at your restaurants, and they can pay a small fee to come and look at what you're protecting. Uh, we're also starting to develop a, what we're at this point calling a ranger corps, a group of tribal young adults and local town young adults who would be trained to be the guides for you and with you uh, when people sign up to come and look at the ceremonial stones. So they would be shown and they would be talk to about the tribal uh, culture and lore. And that would be a way of helping to raise funds. What we recognize is that this is America. <laughs> and unfortunately in America, um, incentives make a big difference. So if you can have a financial incentive, um, things go better. Any other questions? Okay, uh, I'd like to, sh yes. We are right now 
engaged in the protection, identification and protection of some structures that um, Jim Haskins can better describe than I can, but there was a proposed solar farm project and where they wanted to put them was right in the middle of ceremonial stones. Uh, but Jim has a number of sites in the region that he will show you and we can discuss and um, have more questions as they come up. Yes, sir. How did you get that from Easter Island? <laughs> Well, Jim, Jim is going to describe it, and it's not from Easter Island. Yes, ma'am. The last time you were here at Historic Society, you were going to Holliston afterwards, and we asked you if you, there's a huge stone structure between here and there that's on the golf course in Holliston. We have not seen the stone structure that oh, you're talking you about, but we have been to Holliston. Oh. But so, well, I, I'll, I'll, I will still get there. Yes, ma'am. Well, you can contact Kathy, or you can contact me, and I'm, you can send it to my email address, which is dh, my initials, Doug Harris, n-i-t- H, P, and if it's sent to T, which is the trust, then Kathy will be certain to. I don't, I don't think you have the trust. Oh, well then send it to NIT. I, I have some contact information here. All right, so it'll, it'll be sent to DHNITHPO at gmail.com. And just remind me, well, at the Make sure it starts out with CSL. Then I'll know what it's about. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, what time of year is the uh, um, medicine spoon rise called the bear back? That's at the time of the um, autumn equinox. And uh, on the reservation, we have two boulders with a a large flat stone between the two and that creates the artificial horizon line and we have a stone grouping and a line of stones that lines up perfectly with it we've got to cut a few trees to see if in fact we can actually see the dipper but um, we believe that to be so and it's usually found at about plus five degrees on the compass So when we find plus five or plus 10 degrees, we assume that that's what we're looking at. And we start looking for, okay, where is it? There's gotta be an alignment. There's gotta be an artificial horizon line. And sometimes we find it and sometimes we don't. Jim, you've got some slides you wanna share locally. Yes, yeah, so this head stuff here came across in Cameron Woods about 12 feet tall, 18 feet long, about 8 feet wide. But it does look like it's been modified in the front. Sure. Now I'll ask you to lend your microphone to Oh. Otherwise I don't want to hear you on camera. It's the changing of the guard. That's in Cameron Highlands, Cameron Woods, uh, over in Woodsville area, near Lake Whitehall. It's off Linger Street. Uh, let's see, this one is closer to Whisper Way.
This is a uh, photo that was donated to me or sent to me by John Ritz. To split stone with two stones holding it up. Do you have anything to say about this, Doug? Don't move the two stones. Don't move the two stones. <laughs> The, the position that we take, a lot that, we, that was not handed down to us, but we feel that we have the responsibility to protect what we find. We don't know if, in fact, by altering it, we will release energies that should be left at the control of our mother here. So uh, I, I don't want to present myself as being all-knowing because I am not. But I am all protected. I'll do whatever I can to make sure that first thing we figured out was that there weren't enough Indians to protect everything that needed to be protected. That we had to reach out to non-native people and get your support in your towns to help with that protection. And we have been shocked, pleased, at how well the non-native community has responded identifying and protecting these sites. This is a balanced stone in Cameron, Cameron Woods, close to where the headstone is. It's not shown in this photo, but on the front of it is a outcrop coming out the front of it in the shape of a turtle head with an eye and a mouth cut into it. Now it was pointed out to me that it also looks like a sky seat for observation. But we really haven't done any studies on it. So possibilities for many things. Now this I have a lot of curiosities about with the split stone and the stone in the wedge is actually teardropped. This here is actually over where the solar farm was supposed to be put in. Uh, I've been told that medicine people used to compete with each other around the ability to do such things as split stones. I haven't witnessed it, I haven't been there, I haven't had a medicine man tell me or a medicine woman tell me that, but I've been told that by other people. So I share that piece of lore with you. This was a very interesting group in, which is over in the new area in Cameron Woods that I just came across. The flat stone on top of the wedge stones with stones placed on top of it to balance it. We often have lore from Scotland and Ireland that people want to use to fill the gaps in what we know. I'm sorry, but uh, until an Indian tells me that X means X, I'm not going to accept Y from Scotland or Ireland as the answer. This is a uh, balanced stone that pace actually came from that outcrop where it slid down, but it was placed back up on top. This runs right along a stream, and behind it is an enclosed U-shaped uh, uh, enclosure. To me, it looks like an effigy stone. 
from different angles. I think that we might also possibly categorize it as a seat because of that capacity. But what we do with the seats, you've got to be able to sit on it, and it's got to be pointing you in the direction of an important celestial event um, that would have made it of interest to the ancients. But in this case, it would be a seat for a child. Because of the size of the stone. That's small. Yes. Well, the card there, it's five inches in length. Or six inches. We found this very interesting scalloped stand in stone. We have several of these out in the Cameron Woods area, these niches. Usually associated with other groupings in the area that they're sitting. We've often been told that uh, the little people, up regions, up Raji, uh, are active in some of these places would be too small for you or me to crawl into. Um, and that's activity very much like the leprechauns and the, the little people of Scotland and Ireland. So there's a lot in common. Uh, whether it's the same, I don't know. Now this is a uh stone row about 60 feet long with the large head on the front. And this is over between Chamberlain and Whalen. And if I remember correctly, while we were there, this is the one that had a alignment of 142 degrees. But it's just one of these short rows. It's, it's not a, actually a wall. It's just stacked stones in a row with a head. And it has a niche on the tail end of it. I have a question. Is, well, that, is that one, is that going to be affected by that development? It's possible. It is close enough to the wetlands that it might be saved. And this is just a variety of the different stone groupings, a single stone. Actually, it's two triangle stones. And as Doug mentioned, you see a variety of different turtles out there. Once you start recognizing them, you can't walk through the woods. Is there any more? They will call out to you now. Um, there was an area where I used to work in Rhode Island, and I would pass the same field twice a day. And finally, one day, I look out there and I can see all these stones. Wait a minute. How could these stones have always been here? Well, they were. I just wasn't tuned to look at them. And recently, there was a gypsy moth infestation. And it really cleared the trees. They cut a bunch of the trees. And that area, there's even more stones than I ever knew. They're there. The ancients leave their mark their prayers and uh, as far as I'm concerned I have a responsibility to help protect those prayers in place so if I can twist your arm I can have you come and help me I've noticed that all these are natural stones um, I haven't seen any any um, sculptures of the stones these are, these are statues, these are found rocks placed in many, many, many ways. Um, was there, um, was there 
Also have a section in Hopkinton for the uh, Mineral Spring area. So your town is also represented in that book. For Hopkinton, the Mineral Springs was indigenous first before hotels were put there. Yes. Yes, and you also have the uh, Hopkinton Beehive in the same location, which is mentioned also in the Manitou book. Where, where is that? <coughs> that Hopkinton Beehive. Hopkinton Beehive is on the west side of. No, now it is uh, West Va or, uh, Sudbury. Valley Trustees owns the property now. And there's actually a trail that goes in. But where is it then? From the border of Austin. On the back side of Whitehall Lake, there's a new development that was just built, or they're continual, continuing to build. It's up behind that area. Off Pond Street off of Pond Street. <clears throat> There's a little bit going on here between the split rock and the stone grouping. One of the things that we do, or that I do, is if a tree falls, knocks over the stone groupings. I may remove the tree, but I won't attempt to reconstruct the stone grouping. And the logic for that is, I don't know what prayers were used to construct it, and it would be arrogant of me to assume that I can put it back the way it should have been. I leave it, because that's between Earth Mother and whoever did the original work. And if she wanted a tree to fall on it, bless her heart, she got it. <laughs> now this is a single stone, but that's a piece of quartz, which is about this large. And behind it, there is a large stone grouping and several walls, which is also in the Chamberlain Whalen area. I wasn't there, I don't know. 
but in the tradition, the turtle is the effigy of the teacher. Because teaching is a slow and methodical process, the kind of movement that the turtle is known. So um, those who would be teachers call on the spirit of the turtle to the system. Yes, sir. Of the turtle foundation myths? Yes, there are myths, um, belief systems about how the um, the turtle it was on turtle's back that the earth was created. Um, there are many stories that relate to that, um, but I don't. I wasn't there when that happened. <laughs> Now, earlier you asked about sculpture of man-made stones, and this is one of the examples that I came across. It, to me, it has the shape of a Christmas tree. And it actually sits on top of a stone row with the four stones on it. And that stone itself is about four feet long. It is difficult in a lot of these photos, unless you see them in person. Sometimes in the woods you will also find new structures that are placed by, I had one person refer to them as neo-pagans, okay? Um, and I've also um, heard people say, well, these are all new age stones. There's some that have to do with the um, Buddhist tradition. Um, and we would hope that people would not confuse what is ancient with what is new. Um, and do we have the right to tell other people that they can't stack stones? Well, this is America. Nobody has any right to tell anybody else anything. But we would hope that people would not confuse what is ancient with what is new. And if you are a pagan and you know what you're doing, you have my respect. Um, and we were also called pagans. Um, and that's just a perspective depending on where you yourself are coming from. Now this group in here is close to that stone wall with the structure on it. It's in the vicinity of several springs. Uh, there are stone walls in the area, but this is not connected to any of them. It's independent by itself, and again, the purpose of it, no idea. Uh, been there once, came across it, and uh, well, had a field day Sorry. photograph and everything. And this is over in Cameron Woods also. Quite a bit in there. There's several stone procedures that are related to the journey of spirits into the south. <clears throat> and to assist in that process. Sometimes the stone features represent not burials, but the spirit energy of people who were deceased. Um, we have a place in Rhode Island where the, there is a, a square that is open on one side and it's open to the west. And in that square of stones, there are about three, 238 stone groupings. And we are recently assessing that those stone groupings, which are open toward a hill, and the hill carries the name, well, they call it now Lion Key, but we deciphered it that in the pre-colonial era, it was known as Wailun Mkeke. And 
Wayun KK is the set of words that the, um, in Narragansett mean sun setting hotter. And the belief is that when the sun sets at the time of the equinox, that the otter, which is a dark shadow in the Milky Way, is rising behind that hill. What we found is that the open side of the stones in the adjacent hill, which is called Nipsichuk, is facing that. So our belief is that the spirits, the spirit energies that were brought to that hill were placed there so they could make their journeys at the appropriate time when the otter can carry them on into uh, Kautaka's house. The intriguing thing is that we now believe that the stones represent people who were massacred at a place called Nipsichuk base of Cat Hill and Vanity Swamp in South in um, North Stony in North um, Smithfield. And that was in 1676. And the previous year the woman chief of the Pacasets, Wheatamu, came there with a number of refugees and they were assaulted. And they were defended by King Philip Medicon and his defenders. But a number of them were killed. And so the question now is, is that, is that place where the stones are the combined memorialized of those who killed in the massacre and those who were killed in the previous year? How many more slides do you have? And we're still trying to study. I don't that. know. I can end it any time. It was said that only 171 were killed in the last year, but I had a book on the day, I was, the day after our other medicine man passed away, I was awakening at 3 o'clock in the morning and walked over to my bookshelf, sat down, and I looked at the bookshelf and one of the books was turned upside down. I don't put my books away outside. So I had to ask the question, why is that book upside down? I opened, pulled the book out. I opened it up. The page I opened it to was a page that specifically stated that Colonel Talcott had killed 360, pardon, three, 200 and 38 people. I've never seen that number. I've always seen the number 171. So I said, that's close to the number of um, stone features that are in that enclosure. So is this enclosure somehow related to the massacre? I contacted the state historic, the retired state historic preservation officer. He said, no, I don't think that's correct. Uh, an older account says that it's 171. But it might be the number that Talcott and his militia killed that day at Nipsichuk and the following day in Warwick. OK, well, if it could be more than one day, maybe it's what happened the year before. And I believe that's what happened. But we're still, we're still trying to decipher the But. Right now, we're looking at those stone features as being memorials to the dead. Where the dead were buried, we don't know. One thing I've noticed going through the forest, looking at these features, is the variety of Manitou stones. And in my opinion, this is a Manitou stone, which is actually over four feet tall. Uh, and this is in a complex that I'm working at over at Lake Whitehall. Just another variety of stone groupings, small 
low wall, about four feet wide, about 60 feet long. Does it attach to any other wall? It's by itself. Right. So the question then would become, what is the alignment? So that appears to be almost direct duties. So what we'd like to do is to get a particular compass reading, because the particular compass reading quite often is indicative of a celestial event. We don't usually deal with more of these south and west. <laughs> This is what I look at as another Manitou stone, and this is over where the solar farm is, off the grid of where the solar farm is, but still in that same location. And again, it's another four-foot stone. Now, I don't know. I've been told stones with an L cut into them have a particular meaning as a spirit portal. I don't know if that's correct, but uh, I have come across quite a few stones cut like this. Well, the procedure that we established was if you see it once and it draws your attention, you make note. If you see that same configuration twice, you make note and say this is likely to be cultural. You see it three times as cultural. And so that becomes the basis of the logging system that we have developed. Um, and we would share that with you with the expectation that we protect it, you protect it, it's protected. And I think Doug is familiar with this now. This is a stone structure over where the solar farm is going to be put in, which is going to be protected now. I don't think anybody's really sure what it is, but uh, very interesting. I can see it. I don't know if anybody else can see it. Can you see the face in this stone? up in this area over here? You have to get, really, is there, it's almost like you need to get close up. Can you, can you, um, can you focus? Eye, nose, mouth. Yeah. Yes. Um, can you enlarge that piece so you can see it? Uh, through this process, I don't think so. And this is a U-shaped enclosure over near Lake Whitehall with a uh, alignment uh, due north. First time I looked at this, I wasn't sure what it is, but after looking at the photos, it, to me it looks like a turtle shell. And there are other groupings around it. And get another modified stone that looks like a Manitou stone with the head, the shoulders. You, you say a uh, modified. Um, was there a sign the stone had been worked? Uh, up in this area here where you can see it has been knocked out, you have the same thing on the other side. Okay. And this is a, another stone that looks like it's been modified with the head and the shoulders. And these all sit upright in the ground. Some of them have been knocked over in time, but most of them are upright. One of the things that we have found is that in ancient times there were standing stones, and the colonial spiritual tradition uh, coming out of England 
was challenged by the spiritual nature of these stones. And so in many instances, they knocked them down. So there are places where you'll see that a stone had once been upright, or many had been upright, and then they were knocked down. Um, and that's just a clash of cultures. We found that sometimes churches were put on top of spiritual sites um, to establish dominance over the previous culture. 